Um, there are other examples of these things. Um, in uh, Baltimore, there are these uh, Baltimore notes that circulate. A B note, here's one. It has a beautiful picture. It has a uh, Frederick Douglass on the front and a beautiful picture of an Oriole on the back. Um, there are a lot of, of these kind of complementary currencies floating around right now, mainly in small communities. Now, you may ask yourself, doesn't the government worry about this a little bit? Well, the answer is actually no. Um, the US government and the IRS have basically said, you know what, this is fine. These are mainly small scale activities. They're usually limited in geographic scope to um, a county or a small town. And they're basically a kind of further step in a barter network. It's still kind of barter as far as the IRS is concerned, as far as the government is concerned. People have agreed to exchange services with each other, just like in a barter network, but they're using this note as the medium of exchange, as an intermediary. The one catch is, according to the IRS, any income that you make in an alternative or complementary currency, like the Ithaca Hour or the B note, must be reported on your, um, on your tax form. You're supposed to actually write in the words barter income in a little space on the form and then record the dollar equivalent value of that income. Now, <clears throat> I've, I've given you an overview of, of some of the kinds of alternative and complementary currencies in the US and elsewhere. I also just want to get you, you thinking as I wrap up about the kinds of alternative and complementary systems that you engage in probably without even realizing it. So for instance, does anybody have frequent flyer miles? I bet you do, right? What are those? Well, those are kind of tokens that represent value that is denominated in the terms of the airline, and they get to set the terms of how much that's worth. But in a way, that's a kind of complementary currency, right? That expands the amount of value that you have access to. That expands your wealth, only to do a particular thing, of course. You can only use it to fly, but it's still adding, it's still complementing the other kinds of currency instruments you have access to. Or take another example. Um, <clears throat> there are a lot of, of online services that at one time or another have offered various kinds of credits or tokens that you can use within an online community, within a virtual world, or within a game. For instance, I have an old um, $15 card for Facebook credits. Right? Facebook experimented for a while with um, developing a kind of online alternative currency only to be used within the context of Facebook transactions um, and for things like um, games that you might play within Facebook. This one is branded with um, The Sims, for instance. And these are interesting because they're backed by the US dollar, right? They're basically an electronic coupon um, that stands in a one-to-one -one relationship with the US dollar. Um, but once they start circulating online, once people start trading them, and once people try to start trading them between platforms, between games, or between virtual worlds, you start to get something that looks a lot like lots of little alternative economies, lots of little separate economies using these alternative monies. Um, these are things that are really interesting to watch and to think about. We can think of World of Warcraft Gold or Second Life um, Linden Dollars and other kinds of, of credits like these. These also inspired um, companies like American Express to start experimenting with new kinds of loyalty points and loyalty programs that would start to operate like um, electronic tokens of value, like electronic credits in the place of money. Um, there, just to bring this to a close, you know, there are a couple of, of very commonplace um, complementary currencies that you probably also um, have with you or have used in the past or even just in the past week. So for instance, um, this is a San Francisco Muni card, right? I buy this for a certain amount of money and encode it into it is that value, which then I can use again to only do one kind of thing. I can only use it to go on, on the, um, the Muni in San Francisco. That's pretty much it. Um, but what's happened here is normal US dollars have been taken out of circulation and turned into a kind of currency that I can use for a special purpose, right? And one of the things that we find with complementary currencies 
is they do tend to be special. Special purpose. We usually can only use them for one kind of thing or in one kind of context. Even something like the Ithaca Hour can only be used in Ithaca. This thing can only be used um, on the San Francisco Muni. I just have one other example. You're probably familiar with these. This is a coffee shop punch card, right? Every time I go to this coffee shop and get a coffee, I get a little stamp. When those things all equal however many stamps I need to get, 10, then I can go and get a coffee. Now what's interesting about these is this is special purpose, right? I can only use it for a coffee drink at this particular coffee shop. But how much is this worth? Well, it's really up to the shopkeeper to decide how much this is worth. In this case, for this coffee shop, this has a value of anywhere between like 99 cents and probably up to like $4.50, because I can use this, once it's filled out, for any coffee drink. And that's another interesting feature about complementary currencies. Um, they're special purpose, but their value can sometimes be stretchable or changeable. It's not like this is always equal to $1 or $2. Um, the value of this changes um, and can take on different characters depending on what I want it for. So that gives you um, a kind of bird's eye overview of alternative and complementary currencies. There's a lot more to delve into, and I'd encourage you to do some research on your own to learn more about these things. But when we talk about you know, new digital currencies or Bitcoin or other altcoins, as we'll be doing in this class, it's really helpful to just remind yourself that this isn't wholly uncharted territory. People have played around with these kinds of ideas before, not necessarily in a digital space, but out there in the world. Thanks very much.